And then let's go ahead and dive in. So welcome everybody. I am Christina from Lucid Press. This is a joint webinar. We've got lots of special guests today to talk about creative at scale. So I'm going to start by introducing everybody here. But before we jump into that, just a reminder, if you got the notice, we are doing a DoorDash giveaway. So if you're looking for free lunch, you're in the right place. This will happen at the end of the webinar and you will need to be present to get it. So just stick around and then at the end, we'll announce that and get that free lunch out to you. All right, so our speakers today, like I said, I'm Christina Sanders. I am the Inbound Marketing Manager for Lucid Press. Lucid Press, we're a brand templating platform that helps you templatize and scale content creation across your company. And I'm really excited to be here with a lot of special guests today. Uh, first is Travis. He is the VP of Customer Experience for Brand Folder, a digital asset management system. And Travis, I will let you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell the audience about yourself. Great, thanks Christina and thanks everyone for taking some time to join us here. Um, as Christina was saying, my name is Travis. I am the VP of Customer Experience at Brand Folder. Uh, we are a uh, digital asset management platform, highly visual and uh, visually elegant and intuitive, really geared around helping uh, creatives, marketers, and really a lot of folks uh, like those on the call here get their content out into the wild uh, to the folks that need it and really understand you know, how that's performing. Um, and I think a lot of that, really what we do every day here ties in nicely to kind of the overarching topic that we'll, uh, we'll be digging into here. So excited to be here. And uh, again, thanks everyone for joining. Great, and then we want to introduce, we're going to call them our experts, our guest experts. Uh, so do you actually want to introduce Liza since you work with Liza? Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, Liza Weingarten, who joins us from uh, Endeavor Global, she's the head of communications. Liza, I'll hand it over to you. I don't want to steal all of your thunder, so. Sure, um, thanks Travis. So yeah, I head up communications at Endeavor Global, which is an organization that supports high impact entrepreneurs around the world. Awesome. And then our second guest is Tammy um, from Healthcare Business Women's Association, and I will let you introduce yourself as well. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tammy Bruzon. I'm the marketing manager for the Healthcare Business Women's Association. Uh, we are a membership association whose core purpose is to further the advancement um, and impact of women in the business of healthcare. Um, I'm, I'm very excited for today, so thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and jump into the content. So again, today's topic is creative at scale. So what we're gonna be talking about is how we as marketing teams, content creators can really help push and get content to, to, to increase volume, but also to scale that across a company. How do we get everyone involved in this and do this in a way that's effective? So the way this will work, we're going to go through some five tips for this. And so Travis and I will introduce each tip, but then we really just wanna turn it over to our experts and let them give you their advice and share what they've done to do each of these things. So tip number one is approaching content like a content experience. Uh, and I like to lay the groundwork for this. So most of us who are in marketing, we're familiar with the idea that you know, marketing, it used to be this mass marketing thing where the marketer created this one message, it went out to a mass audience, it was super easy to control. Where now we've switched over to where lots of people are involved in marketing. You've got your, your partners, your sales team, and there's a whole bunch of different fragmented channels to go through. There's your website, there's your email, there's social media, and then it's going to a fragmented audience. Most businesses have multiple personas and multiple people that they're working with and trying to talk to. And because of that, most companies are creating significantly more content. Uh, this stat, 72% of organizations are producing significantly more than they did a year ago. And if you can see in the source down at the bottom, this is actually from 2014. So it's only grown and gotten so much bigger even since then. And so let's talk about, so why would a content experience matter to your brand and what does that mean? So, I've shared this, this is a report from Forrester, this was from 2018. And they're looking at how effective is content marketing that businesses are putting out. And they found that um, a lot of people feel like it's actually not 
gotten better. It's actually gotten worse over time. So they feel like content isn't very helpful. There's almost too much of it. It's hard to sort through. They find it easier to go to other sources. And so because of this big influx of content and kind of just the inundation of content being everywhere, um, as businesses and as marketers, like myself, even in my role, we've had to really focus on how do we create content that really is effective and provides the right experience we want for our customers. And where this, I like to think of this as taking that little bit of extra effort to really make content personalized and custom to the person that you're talking to, as opposed to like one giant effort. It's more just that little extra 1% of delight. And I like to share this example. I subscribe to this clothing service. They basically send you a text once a month with a link that then takes you into this personalized showroom. So you just click the link, it goes in, it's all new options, all in my size already, which is super convenient and nice. Um, and then when they send the, when you, if you order something and they send the clothing in the mail, you get it in this package and they just, they have this little extra bit of delight where they send this compliment and it just says, hey, adorable on the outsides. And then you open it up and it says, you have great taste. And every time I get it, I'm just like looking forward to it because I'm like, I'm gonna get a compliment from this company and it's gonna tell me I have great taste and I love it. So I think that's a great example of just that little bit of extra delight you can do to create an experience with the content that you create. And so what we want to talk about a little more in depth is how to make that bridge, how to bridge that gap between your brand story and that experience that the customer is looking for. So first thing we talk about is how do we shift your team's mindset? How do you get away from maybe large volumes of mundane content to really focusing on how to engage with customers? So Tammy, I want to ask you, what have you done to help push content towards really effective engaging content? Absolutely. Um, we're all about the building the customer persona and, and trying to identify what the customer journey is and how we can best uh, suit the content around where we want them to go and ultimately how, they, how we want them to engage with us. Um, we're not only working within Lucid Press uh, for our graphics to do that uh, at the staff level, but I work with the team of, uh, we've got 65 accounts or so with a, a smattering of uh, additional volunteers, so let's say 100 volunteers working within the system um, that are, so we're able to sort of cut out the, that sort of mass marketing point that you mentioned earlier, and really focusing in on each level of volunteer being able to focus, being able to speak to their local customer. So we make sure that um, within the parameters, providing them with parameters uh, within our branding and in our templating, we're able to make the most use of their limited time. Um, and, and they then can focus on creating and designing for the event that they're promoting, um, the program that they're trying to, to make known, um, celebrating the wins of their volunteers and members, and really speaking to the voice and the experience of the, the end user, the, the customer, um, the member. Uh, in their local area and speaking to and with that voice. Great, I love it. Eliza, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. I think for us, kind of similarly as a global organization with offices in so many different countries across the world, um, you know, we have different language barriers and cultural barriers, but we are one brand. So one of our biggest challenges has sort of been building a consistent customer experience. And so um, really, you know, centralizing in making our branding consistent has been key to that to make sure that anyone who interacts with the Endeavor brand around the world, you know, has a sort of consistent experience, um, can expect the same things whether they attend an event, um, you know, in New York or Sao Paulo. So um, one of the ways we've done that is just through a lot of templating and centralizing our assets. Okay. Um, and then obviously, I, you mentioned this a little bit, but educating everybody on the importance of branding is obviously a huge part of this, making sure everyone's on board with why content matters, why branding matters. Uh, so Tammy, going back to you, how have you gone about this helping everyone across your organization really embrace the importance of branding and content? Um, I think it, one of the big sources we lean on is, is onboarding. So making sure that all of the 
tools are, are available, the resources, they know where to go to get the answers that they need and they know who to talk to to get information. Um, but as Liza was saying, it's a lot about that centralization point and knowing exactly where things are, um, what's approved, not approved, um, and, and then having touch points along the way. You know, we have regular touch points with our volunteers to make sure that we're not only answering questions as they arise or um, um, letting them know that there's, there have been changes along the way, but we're data sharing and, and um, focusing on, on what's there, what's new, and just constant touch points, um, really providing as much access to information, but also centralizing it at the same time. Great, Liza, anything to add to that? No, I would, I mean, I would have to agree. I would say that, you know, centralizing for us has just been a huge, huge step toward really building consistent branding. Um, we're a 20 year old organization and surprisingly, it's only been about, you know, four or five years that we've really all been using like the same up to date logos and the same colors and fonts. And so I think for us, um, you know, as Tammy mentioned, it's, it starts with onboarding, but it is also about having those touch points throughout, you know, um, the experience of a staff member or an entrepreneur we service and making sure that everybody does have one central place to go for that information. Um, for us, that's brand folder, but yeah, I know for Tammy, it's Lucid Press and, you know, it's, it's about building up that resource. Awesome. All right. So tip number two, take it away. Yeah, so, and I, I think this is really just given what we do kind of right within our wheelhouse. So I, I would love to see just in our chat here, a quick show of hands as far as who either personally or someone within your organization or someone you work with has gone out and accessed your logo by searching for it on Google or any other piece of content or asset that you might be uh, otherwise looking for. So just get a show of that in the, the chat here while we dig into some of these things. So I think if no, Fantastic job. You're ahead of the pack here. And if yes, um, I would say that is something that certainly warrants some some consideration here. I'm glad to see some no's because for me personally, that is terrifying. Um, I think for those who are no's, a fun slash terrifying experiment here is to go out and search for your logo on Google and see what you find. Um, this is an interesting one because I think this really highlights some of the, uh, the issues that you're going to run into here. Um, see quite a few yeses as well. Uh, so for Slim Jim, we've got their current logo, which is great. I'm sure that's what they would hope people find. Uh, we've got every previous iteration that they've ever had, which is less than ideal. Uh, and even worse, it looks like we've got some kind of amateur Photoshop type submissions going on here. Uh, for anyone behind that brand, I think that's probably just a nightmare come true. Um, so really, you know, Best case, this dilutes your brand. Worst case, you know, you could be looking at financial or legal implications, depending on trademarking and copywriting, whatever have you. Um, so on this next slide, just a couple tips. Oh, I'm sorry. That stat here that I think on that note, um, it's pretty common that people see things being created and sent out that are not within the, the guide rails that, you know, our branding team puts out there. Um, with that in mind, and I think tying that back to a, a single resource here, some tips that I'd like to dig into. Um, really, this boils down to an inefficient use of, you know, if you are in marketing or creative, uh, an inefficient use of your time. Um, in these particular roles, you know, your skill set is too valuable, your workload is likely way too high uh, to be spending that kind of time fielding one off emails for your logo or basic manipulations to a file. Um, I think the other thing here is that if your content doesn't live in a single place, you're absolutely at a risk for, you know, that Slim Jim logo from 2013 being used. Um, the other thing that I can personally vouch for here is that asset sprawl is very real. So keeping content in, you know, three to five to 10 different places can be just as bad as having no dedicated resource at all. Uh, and when this happens, you know, people will absolutely get creative when they're in a pinch to find the thing that they need. Uh, and when they are in that pinch, they're not really concerned about the downstream effects here. Uh, the other point that I think is huge is embracing findability and usability. So even if you have a dedicated resource for all of these things and it's hard to use, people just can't find what it is that they're looking for, uh, they're right back to Google. 
Uh, so ideally, the system of record that's being used should accommodate you know, your most technically challenged user uh, all the way to you know, your technology powerhouses. Um, and there's different levels of kind of end user empowerment here, uh, all of which prevent you from wasting your time on kind of fulfilling these requests. Um, what does that all boil down to? I think it's speeding up really your organization's ability to, to execute on these campaigns. Um, I think it's, you know, one of those harsh realities that inefficiencies typically beget further inefficiencies. Um, and a fine-tuned, you know, uh, streamlined central repository really allows your people and your constituents to self-serve. Uh, and there's really almost no alternatives that will work as efficiently as that. Um, so with that, Liza, I'd love to kick it over to you just to kind of dig into some of the challenges that, that you faced in your organization and kind of how that ties in here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it's funny because so many of the things that you mentioned um, were just challenges that we were facing on such a constant basis. Um, you know, we are an organization with 500 staff around the world operating under one brand, um, but our marketing team here in New York is four people. So we were constantly, you know, fielding emails, like it was taking up, you know, almost probably 40% of our day, just trying to find things for people, um, correcting people when they were using out of date logos, which happened frequently. Um, and, you know, you mentioned asset sprawl um, and how that sort of leads to inconsistency. And so we were relying so much on self population of things and, you know, we were reinventing the wheel all the time. So we really needed a solution that could help us just kind of, you know, bring all of our assets under one place and have us operating as one unified brand. Um, and so having, having that solution for us has just been like, it has changed the way that we operate as marketing teams across the world. And it, not only has it saved myself and my colleagues like so much time, I can't even tell you actually, but it's really just led to kind of this larger culture of brand unity, which has been amazing for us. Um, so, you know, since launching um, our digital asset manager, which is brand folder, um, we, you know, people are able to create on brand materials more easily. Um, they're able to just kind of take it upon themselves to go find the materials that they need, whether it be our logos, our fonts, um, or, you know, approved language and messaging. So that, that's been essential um, just to have things up to date. Um, and so this has also just allowed us to, you know, scale our efforts a lot you know, as our team as well. Now that we're spending less time on these things, we can focus more on, you know, creating content and, and really building our brand rather than trying to get our brand all under, on the same page and kind of operating as one. Uh, uh, valid points. Absolutely. Um, Tammy, anything that, that you wanted to add to, to that, that point in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I echo that. I love that, Liza, the brand centricity equaling brand unity as well, especially at a global scale. I, I echo that fully. Um, I really, one of the great things about having that central source of truth is also this sense of um, if it doesn't come from within that central source, it's not approved, it's not allowed. There's no no questions asked. That's the, that's the lay of the land. Um, and I think that um, also just cuts down so much wasted time, so many, you know, one-off requests that you might receive that would bog down your day. Yeah, 100%. And then I, I think on this, this next slide here, just to kind of bring that back around with, I, I don't know, somewhat of a, a depressing statistic here, just 51% of marketers and creatives report that they waste money creating assets that go unused uh, simply because people don't know that they exist or can't find them. Um, and and I, I'll say that's a, neat, a thing that's easily oversimplified, but also just with some thought and effort um, by and large can be eliminated. Um, great, so tip number three, I'll, I'll kick this one off and then hand this over to you, Christina. So um, some thoughts around this one here on this next slide. Um, over the last you know, number of years, we've seen a dramatic increase in the amount of content um, but the engagement go down, um, which is interesting. And I think that's also telling uh, that, you know, there may be some undue work happening here. Um, so some thoughts on that. The um, more content does not always mean better results. And I think, you know, everyone in here would, 
would acknowledge that and, and agree with that. Um, some ideas really back that up. Your assets can't and won't last forever, but that does not mean that they're bad. So it's, it's not to say that you shouldn't make new stuff. You absolutely should. Um, but I would strongly wager that there's many hidden nuggets in some of the things that you've already created that could be repurposed. Um, some very easy ways to cash in on this is just digging into content that's performing well um, and recycle that. So some, some obvious things that we've used as, you know, putting a blog into a podcast format or a PowerPoint or into an infographic. Um, the list is, is long and long and continues to go on, but there's lots of opportunities here. Um, I think a lot of this, which maybe is not so easy, is really figuring out what about that piece of content drove that success. Um, identify that pattern and really maximize what you're getting out of that as far as revamping and recreating. Um, this one, I think, is, is kind of to that point on wasted time, just around cutting back on edit requests. So any, anyone here, your time is too valuable to be you know, spending hours updating contact information on a business card or putting logos on for print materials, whatever it may be. Um, that is something that, again, you, know, you can really put into the hands of the people that are making those requests. Uh, and there's, I think, a huge benefit in making you know, updates to the small things. I would think that you know, while everyone is different here, um, you likely have time to make 100 small updates, but almost certainly don't have time to make 100 new pieces of content from scratch. Um, and then this one here is also, I, I think, I, I always think back to this very passive aggressive, let me Google that for you kind of response to something, but remind your stakeholders where this stuff lives. Um, when you get uh, these requests coming to you, however it comes to you, uh, don't fall into the trap of accommodating every ask that comes across your desk. Uh, use that opportunity to teach that person to fish, if you will. You know, point them to where this stuff lives um, and really empower them to help themselves, not only for that ask, but every other ask that they might have down the road. Uh, it's really kind of about reinforcing these habits and these patterns of behavior. Um, Christina, you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to dive into this idea of templatizing. So um, we've talked a lot about, you know, making sure assets are accessible, your logos, your colors. Um, but a step beyond that even is templatizing the content itself. So thinking about taking a flyer, turning it into a template, it might even be a completed flyer, full design, full messaging, but then templatizing it so that anyone on the team who then needs to say customize it to a local a local source or maybe a different persona, they can go in and customize it really easily instead of having to go back and ask for a whole brand new flyer. And it basically allows you to reuse and refresh everything that you've already spent so much time creating. Um, and then I want to turn it over to Tammy and Liza. Do, do either of you want to jump in and comment on this idea of refreshing content? Yeah, I'm happy to. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tammy. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hop in um, on this one and just re reiterate what Travis said about, you know, really wanting to, to reduce the amount of time um, on staff to complete requests and minimize the approval processes. So being able to automate, um, whether it's having that single source or, or templatizing in this way, um, you know, for us, we're able to look at our annual cycle. We know the shelf life on some of the materials that we've created um, and can then stagger a refresh of others, whether that's you know, new brand photography, building out new templates, or looking at sort of overall campaigns behind our annual cycle that we can say, okay, we need to create something new, create a template out of it, make it accessible to the segments who need it, um, and, and not have all the requests all the time and can really make that a more manageable workload. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with all that. And then, you know, just echoing what Travis was saying about how assets don't last forever. You know, we have like a lot of metrics that we keep track of and things like that. And we were having a problem where we would frequently just find that our local offices were using out of date metrics from maybe even like years ago. So having, being able to refresh those without actually changing where they live or what they're called makes it so that there is, um, you know, just to use that term again, like a central place of truth that people can go and just find it and they know that if they check it, it's up to date. Um, and then also kind of 
on the templating side or repurposing content, you know, from a designer standpoint on our lean team, I feel like my graphic designer would want me to say this because he was always fielding all these mundane design requests. Now we're, it's also very easy for us to repurpose things. You know, we can take a map or something like that from a presentation that we've made and we can take the PNG of it um, and just put it somewhere so that it can be used as a graphic rather than creating a bunch of new assets. Great, I love that. Um, repurposing can be really powerful. Um, so this really takes us into tip number four, which is empowering everyone to be a content creator while still maintaining the brand control that we're looking for here. Um, so going back to this library of templates, obviously templatizing content really helps empower people to be able to create their own stuff. And one piece of advice we like to give is make sure you're not overwhelming people. You'll notice that when we set up our templating system, we divide it up by team, by content type. So that way when the person's going in to find what they need, they're not searching through you know, thousands of things, a lot of it not really applicable to their situation. And then from there, locking things down. So what we do, we have basically our red lock, which is complete and total lockdown. You cannot change this. This generally applies to things like a logo where there's no reason anyone should ever change that. And then there's the yellow lock, which is a partial lock. Basically, it allows you to lock down your font, your color, your layout, all of your really brand focused things. But then anyone can go in and update the copy to what they need it to say and what they need it for their specific use case. And obviously a big part of this is having set brand guidelines and then making these assets readily accessible. So connecting those brand assets, whether you put them in LucidPress or in a digital asset management system, um, and then connecting it to those templates. And then from there, it's just really easy for anyone. So your sales team, um, your CS team, anyone outside of marketing who needs to go in and personalize content to be able to go in and do that. So Tammy, what are some things that you found to help you to empower other people in your organization to create content? Yeah, uh, templating is a game changer in many ways. I mean, for us, we're fortunate that um, the volunteers that we're working with within the system are all marketers um, or are in a marketing function. So as far as organi organizing the content, we really are doing it more around the programs and offerings and um, event promotions, the, the sort of programmatic things that they're promoting on a regular basis and so there's they can sort through and find what they need to and um, I've started adding year uh, years in there so they can see something that you know that was and maybe we'll start sunsetting and then developing new they can always see what the latest and greatest is um, and it's funny the template locking has been really helpful in terms of keeping brand guidelines in place making sure there's um, continuity across the graphics that are being shared again on a global scale uh, and having, again, your slide there on, on branding guidelines built into the platform makes that really easy as far as colors and fonts and all of that. Um, the really interesting thing, though, is you would think that a locking mechanism might be limiting, but when you test it, send it out, and let them use it, you end up with, that's where the creativity starts. And instead of having to work on the fundamentals, the foundations of how do I build this, where do I want this piece to go, there's a foundation already set up in place and the creativity then can, can start. And it's about the language that's being used, the photos that are leveraged, the way for us, we use um, our brand colors and gradients often. And so there's, you know, play with that and what that looks like and what can fall behind that. Um, and then the best thing uh, from, from the development side of things, once that's been set out into the world is someone will come up with a really great idea. They'll take a template that you've put out for them to use and they'll turn it into something a little new or you will end up with like one ask that's like, hey, maybe could we, could I unlock this a little so I could do this with it? And you all of a sudden you have a new idea that you can then template and make accessible in that way as well. So it's a, it's a self-feeding cycle when you, when you are allowing your people, um, volunteers or staff to be able to be content creators without having to think about the monotony of, of building behind the scenes. I love that, that innovation. That's what I think every company is wanting and hoping for. Liza, did you have anything to add to that? I mean, I'm just nodding in agreement just because we have had such a similar experience with templating. And, and I really liked what you said, Tammy, about, you know, empowering people to kind of have their work or their customizations templated. Um, so that's been something that we've also had a lot of success with. You know, we started building out these templates, um, but 
since we only have two graphic designers, we were only able to do a few at a time. And so our offices around the world, those that had designers started coming up with their own ideas or being like, you know, I saw this thing on, um, you know, Endeavor Indonesia's page and I really liked it. Can we make it into a template? And so it also, I think, helped adopt, helped with the adoption of like this sort of central platform where people realize that could actually be a collaborative process. And to that end, you're not throwing spaghetti at a wall with design ideas. I and you know, Travis's data point earlier of wasting money and time on things people aren't using, well, you're, you're giving them something to use and they're creating something just a little bit nuanced out of it. So it's really streamlining that and, and saving time and money overall. Awesome. All right, so tip number five, and we are gonna have Q and A. So if you haven't posted those questions, go ahead and do that, but then I will turn it over to Travis to talk about data. Right, so this is, this is a topic that I think is um, very near and dear to my heart. One, I think it's just fascinating, but also um, extremely powerful when it's leveraged in, a, in an intelligent way. Um, so 60% here, a stat from Forrester of buyers believe that content vendors provide is, is useless. And I really am sorry for so many sad stats. It seems that's the only stats that I have. Um, but uh, I think this is, is really important and also telling, um, you know, what drove that decision to make that piece of content that ultimately no one really found any value in. Um, so some points on that. I think this first one doesn't really require too much explanation. Wasted content means, means wasted revenue. And it's, I think, really as, uh, as simple as that. Um, some things that we really focus on, you know, in circumstances like this is establishing a feedback loop um, around what worked and what did not, and really focusing on the why. Um, ideally, this happens, this feedback loop within whatever your system of record is or that dedicated resource, um, but also it doesn't have to. I think no matter how it's surfaced, as long as it's being surfaced, um, that's critical. And then I also think even more important than that, that that feedback is acted upon. Um, the data, really for focusing on that, both the quantitative and qualitative aspects. Um, I, I'm a true believer that if you have your parameters set up in an intelligent way, analytics will show you the way. Um, you know, if my data points to a piece of content that has twice the engagement of my typical average, um, it's worth spending some serious time on understanding what drove that increase. Um, and then back to some of these earlier points, once you've identified that pattern, really milking that for everything that it's worth by recreating and reusing that in various ways. Um, but it's also not all about the numbers. You know, when we put something out and our sales team, you know, they'll, they'll use everything that Adam is putting out into the wild. And when they come back and give him, you know, 50 virtual high fives over Slack, um, that absolutely means something. And it's also, I think warrants that deeper look at, you know, what really drove the success around this. Um, now, likely the data on that is also going to fall in line with that really positive kind of anecdotal feedback. Um, really point I'm trying to make is it shouldn't just be one or the other. I think you need to look at that, you know, kind of uh, holistically. Uh, and then the last one, and this is critical, is using trackable distribution methods. Um, you know, that can be as simple as something with a share link that, you know, I, I think literally any platform that houses a file has some way of sharing out. Um, whether or not you can track things on the back end of that is, is you know, I think the question there. Uh, so it can be something as basic as that or something more automated or advanced like a, a CDN or a content delivery network. Um, if you can't track the who, where, what, when, uh, it's going to be hard to impossible to make any sort of informed decisions around that. Um, really, I think what all of this boils down to is um, using uh, your data and listening to your audience to really drive these sorts of decisions on your go forward plan. Um, I think using insights uh, continuously creates efficiencies for your user base, which when we look at, you know, the scale aspect of this whole topic um, is pretty critical. Uh, I know when, if I can see what users within, you know, our platform are, are searching for, I know what they're finding. Uh, more importantly, I know what they're not finding, and I can constantly be improving my tagging, my taxonomy, uh, which all reinforces this kind of self-serve idea. Uh, it really gives you an opportunity as well to curate and refine uh, your audience base environments. Um, and what that means is I can give my, you know, my EMEA sales team access to 100,000 files, which is going to be hard for anyone to navigate. 
or I can use this data and take a very intelligent approach to give them a highly focused set of content that I know that they need. I can kind of trim the fat off of that. Um, and what that results in is my team getting in, getting out, and they're on with their day. Um, and that right there will create night and day efficiencies. Um, so, uh, yeah, on that, Liza, I know that, you know, with regards to kind of your uh, internal and external audiences, um, that this has been a pretty, you know, key factor. So we'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. So I would say like internally, there's no data um, that we've had on Brandholder has really allowed us to better understand, you know, what is most effective on the platform that we've been creating um, among our staff and then also identifying redundancies, um, things that are like maybe we don't need both these presentations, maybe we just need a single asset. Um, we can also see which of our offices are most fully leveraging the platform, which is really useful and kind of track of who needs a little bit more support with branding versus who is a bit more self-sufficient and we can kind of dedicate our efforts better that way. Um, externally, it's also been really interesting for us. Um, we launched an entrepreneur resource center recently during kind of this the health crisis um, as a public facing resource to provide you know, webinar content um, and curated articles and things like that directly to the entrepreneurship community. And so not only was that sort of using the data there um, interesting to see what people were most interested in looking for, um, but it also allowed us to see you know where people actually were accessing our platform from, which for us was really telling just as a global organization, I think. Um, Historically, for us, our audience has been primarily um, in Latin America, which is where we were launched 20 years ago. But we actually started seeing from the platform that we had a lot more of a U.S. audience, which was really interesting insight to us um, because that wasn't typically a geographic audience that we had even thought we were reaching on a larger scale. No, I mean, all interesting points. And I think once you really spend some time digging into that, what you're able to glean from that um, you know, I, I don't think it's always what one would expect, but I think it's always valuable. So, so great points. Um, Tammy, anything that, that you wanted to kind of add to that, that data piece? Yeah, I mean, I, I love the, the idea of the taxonomy and organization as a, as a result of, the, of collecting data and looking at, you know, what's working, where your people are accessing the data, where they're using it. I mean, for us, a, a, a number, probably the more majority of our templates are being used across social media. So we not only have the data of what's most effective and, and what's most impactful in our own social media stats. So sort of looking at um, the bigger picture, we then have sort of the micro data, we'll call it of, of those t regular touch points with our volunteers where we can talk to them both anecdotally and statistically and say, okay, what's working for you? What have you used recently? We can go in and look on our hashtags and see what's been performing well, what has good engagement scores, all of those things. So there, there's very real data in cross locations for us to be able to see what's working best and, and what makes the most sense. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, identifying those redundancies, getting rid of the things that aren't working or aren't serving us well, uh, us being, you know, everybody who's in there as a content creator, and then also um, being able to uh, to see how that's translating into, into financial data, right? At the end of the day, all of that social data that you can have out there about how your content's performing translates into dollars. And so you can look and see like, okay, if this, if we were trying to get them into an event, how did that piece of content work? What did their registration data look like? Cool, that's working the way we want it to. Let's let's build out and, and make sure we've got enough templates um, that we're, you know, that it's organized well, that the taxonomy makes sense um, and all of that. So yeah, data is crucial to, to ongoing, really productive content development. No, and fantastic point. I think the alternative to not using this type of, you know, insights and analytics is, you know, to your point, uh, money on the table. So I love that. For sure. So I'll put these takeaways up again and um, our, our five great points from our panelists. And then we are going to go ahead and do the DoorDash giveaway. So if you've stuck around, this is the moment. Uh, so V on the back end, if you want to go ahead and Pull us that. All right, we've got our winner, Adam Rodriguez. Are you here? Adam is the winner if he's here. Uh oh. Oh, 
there he is. Awesome. Yeah. That was Woo. good to me, Adam. I was about to swoop in and claim that. So. That was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll get in touch with you and get that over to you. Um. All right. So we just want to let you guys know we are having another webinar. Oh, sorry. We have, I didn't realize, we're doing two giveaways. We have two. So one more winner. The second is Brittany Chase. Is Brittany here? Awesome. Yeah. Congrats. We'll get that to you as well. All right. So we do have another webinar coming up. This one will be with Tyson, our very own Tyson. He's going to talk about helping people adopt brand templates. So if you are having a hard time getting people to actually use your stuff, this is the one for you. Um, and then let's go ahead and head over to Q&A. What questions do we have from the audience for our panelists? I know V and Adam have been busy. The, the chat was a flurry while we were talking. So I know I saw one in the chat. So Jody was asking, what's the best practice? Do you send all content at once? to an account or send it in several packages every few days. So she says she runs into the issue where she sends a lot of images, information to accounts, but then nothing happens on our end. So they're asking for it, but then don't do anything with it. So what are you guys' thoughts on how, how do you get people that actually use the stuff and the best way to send that out and communicate it? Jump, jump in here, here. Um, for, for us, us I think I mean, I mean just again, again having, having that central place, place and taking it off of our plate as even just removing the stuff of having to send things, things in general and just, and just being, being like everything you need, need is in this one place um, and, and you can use it or not, not you can access, access you, know, you know in a very easily sort of way I think um, sorry, sorry I'm gonna try to unplug my headphones hopefully that's a little bit better but um, I, think I think the, the you know for external audiences the nice thing is being able to create a like, like shareable link and so you know you know you can package everything at once and just send it one off. Um, I try to just kind of take out as many steps as possible. I love it. Yeah, I, that having that central source makes the most sense, and and I think for us it it always lives there it's always there they can go in at any time they want to and the touch points for us are either in our regular touch points with volunteers or if we make a change if we have something brand new because we're we roll out probably a little bit more slowly but depending on our annual cycle but anytime something or, or a group of things are are newly available and it's not right up next to a, a, t a regular touch point with these folks We'll send out a communication and say hey alert this is here don't forget to go check out the template section and you know comb through see if there's anything else that you might have missed or you know it's really i think those touch points that we talked about you know in the beginning of the webinar are, are the most critical for that if you set the expectation that here's the water here you go and and it's there for you when you need it um with just a couple reminders along the way um folks will get acclimated to it i think that it They'll get used to it the more you do it, and that repetition is just crucial. And I, I love those ideas. One thing that I would add to that, and obviously context is everything in these situations. Um, you know, if you are an agency sending this in a kind of agency client relationship, this is very different from some sort of, uh, you know, you fulfilling something that is mandated that the recipient actually use that, right? Um, you know, one thing that we do see work well is just within that data, you know, just monitoring how they open this, how they downloaded it, how they interacted it within, you know, in any sort of capacity, um, because that really informs kind of the communication path that you take from there. Um, the other thing that we see that creates some urgency around even just taking that down and downloading it is only providing that for, you know, a short window of time. I think just as a best practice, we always recommend share links be sent out with um, some expiration date on it just from a security standpoint. Um, when somebody receives that and they see they have three days to whatever amount of time you've given them, um, I think that does kind of set off some mental note that like, hey, we need to you know, go ahead and use this rather than procrastinate, wait and delay. Um, so just kind of small things to really, um, I, I guess, push people towards the outcome that you're hoping of them. All right, thanks. Well, we are already out of time. It went so fast. But I want to thank all of you for coming and our expert guests. Um, this has been a really great discussion. 
And there was a question about the recording. So yeah, there will be a recording emailed out to everyone. So you'll all have access to that. And thanks so much, everybody. Thanks so much.